Today we're going to talk about parenting. Everybody say parenting. John Wilmot, the Earl of Rochester, once said these words, and I quote, Before I was married, I had three theories about raising children. Now, I have three children and no theories. Many of us are experts on parenting until we become parents ourselves, right? Then we realize that parenting actually is not that easy. In fact, it is a very difficult task to do. But we praise the Lord because we are not all alone in this responsibility. Just as God was the one who has given us this responsibility or assignment to rear up our children, He is also the one who has given us the resources, the ability, the empowerment in order that we will be able to fulfill our responsibility as parents. Now, one of the resources that God has given us, aside from the Holy Spirit who encourages us, teaches us, is His Word. The Holy Word of God or the Bible. In the Word of God, we will see many specific instructions for parents on how to raise their children in the ways of God. One of them can be found in Ephesians chapter 6, verse 4. Turn your Bibles with me to Ephesians chapter 6, verse 4. The Apostle Paul says, Fathers, do not provoke your children to anger, but bring them up in the discipline and instruction of the Lord. Again, fathers, do not provoke your children to anger, but bring them up in the discipline and instruction of the Lord. In other translation, it says, do not exasperate your children. Now, let us break this uh, verse down. The first thing that the Apostle Paul says here is, do not provoke your children to anger. In other words, do not exasperate your children. I understand that in the NIV or the New International Version of the Bible, it says, do not exasperate your children. Now, you might ask me, Pastor Rich, what does it mean to exasperate someone? To exasperate someone means to make that person very angry or frustrated by repeatedly doing something annoying or irritating to him. Again, to exasperate someone means to make that person very angry or frustrated by repeatedly doing something annoying or irritating toward that person. That's what to exasperate someone means. Now, actually, there are many things that parents unknowingly or knowingly do that exasperate their children. Let me share with you several examples. One, severe discipline. Of course, discipline is all right. In fact, we need to discipline our children, right? The problem is some parents are doing it in a severe manner. For example, if we hit our children just about anywhere, okay, indiscriminately, we hit him on the head, we hit him on the body, we hit him on the, on the legs, when we are angry or when the, the, the child has done something wrong, I tell you, that is severe discipline. And for sure, if you keep on doing that for a period of time, it will drive your children to anger. They will be frustrated. They will be exasperated. That's one. Another thing that uh, exasperates our children is unreasonable expectations. Unreasonable expectations. It is normal for us to have expectations of other people. People also expect something from us, right? Right? But the problem is, when our expectation of our children is unreasonable, then eventually it will drive them or it will make them angry with us because that is not reasonable. Another thing is constant nagging. Some parents have the habit of uh, uh, bringing up always or constantly the fault of their children. They always talk about it. They keep on bringing it up. And they also keep on scolding them. Now, we understand there are times when we really need to bring up the fault, right? There are times when we really need to scold our child. But if we keep on doing that over and over again, even if we are justified, you know, for pointing out their fault, eventually, if we are not careful, that will exasperate our children. It will annoy them. It will frustrate them. It will make them very angry. Another thing. Destructive criticism. Constructive criticism is okay. You evaluate an act of someone in order to help him improve. That's okay. 
That's constructive criticism. But we just find fault with someone and criticize someone for it, specifically our children, and we do that over and over again. We have made a habit out of it. Eventually, they will be exasperated. Number five, public humiliation. There are some parents who embarrass their children in public. For, perhaps the child has done something wrong in public. Instead of bringing, uh, uh, bringing the child home and there at home, counsel the child or scold the child, the parents scold the child in front of many people. I tell you, even if they are in the wrong, they still deserve to be respected, right? Once they lose their face and you keep on doing it to them in public, you humiliate them, you shame them, eventually they will get very angry with you and they will be frustrated. Another example is excessive control. I don't know how many parents here are uh, control freaks. Are you control freaks? We want to run every aspect of the lives of our children down to the most minute detail. Of course, it's okay to lead them, to guide them, uh, to some degree, control their lives, especially if they are still minors. But if we keep, do, keep on doing it beyond you know, their uh, young, uh, young years, or we uh, meddle in every aspect of their lives, I tell you, one day they'll get frustrated and they'll be very angry with you. That will exasperate them. And last but not the least, another thing that will make our children very angry with us and uh, frustrated is playing favorites. In other words, favoritism. Some parents are not aware of this, but it does happen, right? If you keep on doing that, perhaps your child will bury you for some time. But in the end, you know, that thing will keep on, uh, will be in his mind through the years. Every time you favor someone for no reason at all, and he will be extremely frustrated in the end with you. The Apostle Paul says, parents, specifically fathers, do not exasperate your children. Do not provoke your children to anger. I know if you've been doing all these things in all likelihood, in the back of your mind, you're thinking that it would help them, right? But listen to this. We also have to do it in the right way, right? We have to do it in the biblical way. And the Lord says, do not exasperate your children or do not provoke your children to anger. Now, aside from that, the Apostle Paul also says that we should bring our children up in the Lord's training and instruction. This is the second part of Ephesians chapter 6, verse 4. It says, bring your children up in the Lord's training and instruction. Now, this basically involves two things. One, educating one's children in the teachings of the Lord. We have to educate our children in the teachings of the Lord. Before the Israelite nation finally entered the promised land, after going in circles, in the wilderness for 40 years, the Lord instructed Moses to gather all the people of Israel. And then he instructed Moses to rehearse to them all the commandments that he revealed to Moses to the people. And so they, there they were on the border, on the other side of the river before they crossed into the promised land. And then Moses rehearsed to them or repeated to them, all the commandments that he received from the Lord on Mount Sinai. Now, among uh, those commandments is uh, the command that we can find in Deuteronomy 6, 4-7. Deuteronomy 6, 4-7, Moses said to the people, Hear, O Israel, Yahweh our God, Yahweh is one. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your might. And these words that I command you today shall be on your heart, parents. Now get this, verse 7. You shall teach them diligently to your what? Louder, what? Children. Parents, you have to teach the word of God diligently to your children and shall talk of them when you sit in your house and when you walk by the way and when you lie down and when you rise. This is our responsibility from God as parents. We have to educate them in the teachings of 
the Lord. We have to spend time doing so. In fact, the Word of God says that we should do so diligently, not only on certain occasions, not only when we are inspired or we like doing it. No. It says we have to educate our children in the teachings of the Lord diligently. Diligently means faithfully. Diligently means consistently, regularly, with much effort. Amen? In fact, it says here in verse 7, let me read it to you again. You shall teach them diligently to your children and shall talk of them or the word of God when you sit in your house and when you walk by the way and when you lie down and when you rise. Meaning, as long as you have the opportunity or every time you have the opportunity to teach them the word of God, you teach them as parents who have been entrusted this assignment from God. Now, some parents, I understand, say that they don't want to influence the decision of their children as far as God and religion are concerned. They say, you know, that's a personal thing. I have my own beliefs about God and religion. They will have their own. So I don't meddle with the, the beliefs, the religious belief of my children. I just let them discover it by themselves. I don't seek to influence them whatsoever, so I don't talk about religion. I don't guide them. I don't teach them whatsoever as far as God and religion are concerned. Do you agree with that? It's very strange because the same parents who are saying these words that they won't try to influence the decision of their, their children in matters of religion are making sure or seeing to it that every day their children brush their teeth, take a bath, take their medicines, take care of themselves, and so on and so forth. I mean, what's more important? The physical body or the soul? I tell you, the physical body one day will die. Of course, we have to take care of our physical body. Of course, we have to take care of the physical bodies of our children. But in the end, this body one day is going to die, but the soul will survive it. And that soul, if it doesn't know God, will go to hell. This world has gone upside down down. Now, I understand some parents are saying that because they want to be politically correct. <laughs> we should influence the world. We should make an impact on the world's thinking, not the world making an impact or mark on our thinking. Don't be afraid to stand upon your convictions, right? In the end, we will all stand before God. And God is not going to ask you about the conviction of the world, about the principles of the world. He is going to ask you about your conviction, your beliefs, your standing before God. So that's the first thing. The Word of God says we have to educate our children in the teachings of the Lord. That's our responsibility. Another uh, facet to bringing up our children in the Lord's training instruction is correcting the children's wrong behavior by disciplining them. Correcting the children's wrong behavior by disciplining them. I tell you, many parents today have become too permissive. They just let their children do whatever they want. Uh, uh, many times, this is based on a wrong concept of love. They think if you love someone, you give in to whatever that person wants. If he likes to do this or he likes this thing, just give it to him. Now, I understand not uh, really many people or parents are thinking along this line, but there are parents like this. They are very permissive because they think that is love. Others think that this is the way their children will learn to love them. Parents want their children to love them back. And they think that if we, they will give everything their children, what the, 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 the children wants, or to allow them to do what they want, that children will love them back. Nancy Samalin, a parent educator in New York City, once said these words, and I quote, Parents want their children to love them. And it is harder to say no than yes especially if you've been working all day 
and you are tired. Uh, some parents, uh, you know, because they are very much aware that they are not spending enough time with their children, they want to compensate for it, and so they just permit their children to do whatever they want or give to their children whatever they like. That's very uh, being too permissive, and that is not right. There are those parents who think that the best way to train children is to let them learn things on their own. They say, give them experience. They will learn it by themselves. Of course, I have no problem with that principle. Okay? Many times, experience will teach us things or teach us wisdom that books will not give us. Right? But I don't agree that this is the best way to train children. Much less is the only way. We still have to, de- to, to guide them. We still have to teach them. We still have to correct them, even discipline them. In order they will know the truth and they will live accordingly. Still, some parents are already tired of the constant struggle to make their children obey. Right? You say the same thing over and over again, and yet our children disobey us over and over again. The story is told of a mother who had a hard time, to say the least, making uh, her son obey. You know, every time uh, she said, you know, son, do this, the child will always find a way to say no, or the child will always find a way not to follow her. So one day, one particularly challenging day, the mother just surrendered. She flung up her hands in the air, and she said, all right, Billy, have it your way. Do whatever you want. Now let me see you disobey that. Parents, because they don't want to go through the hassle of making their children follow them, they just become permissive. They let them do what they want to do. And that is very dangerous. Who says parenting is easy? Many things that are significant of value are accomplished or attained through much effort, through much suffering, right? The same thing if you want to see our children really growing up in the ways of God, becoming godly children. Especially that we, our children have sinful nature and we live in a sinful world with all these uh, very uh, the strong and pervasive influence of the world. We cannot just give up. We're going to just say, okay, have it your way. (laughs) Right? Because a lack of discipline is definitely very harmful to our children. In 1940, uh, school teachers uh, uh, were surveyed to find out the top disciplinary problems in the classroom during this time. Now, take note. This happened in the 1940s, okay? According to that survey, these were the top disciplinary problems in the classroom during the time. Number one, talking. Number two, chewing gum. Number three, making noise. Number four, running in the halls. Number five, wearing improper clothing. Number six, not putting waste paper in the waste paper basket. Those were the top disciplinary problems in the classroom in the 1940s. Now, 40 years after, or in the 1980s, the same survey was done to a different set of school teachers, this time teachers in the 80s. Now, here's the result. Number one, rape. Number two, robbery. Number three, assault. Number four, burglary. Number five, arson. Number six, bombing. Number seven, murder. What has happened? Lack of discipline. Parents have abandoned their responsibility to correct their children by disciplining them. Okay? The previous generation, parents were very strict. 
I know this nowadays. One of the good things nowadays is that parents now know how to relate to their children. Right? Parents now, especially my generation, I am in my 40s, they know how to relate to their children. They spent even dads, okay? They spend time with their children. They now know how to say, I love you to their children. That's why, you know, we have, you know, be better, in a way, parenting or parenting conditions now. But the problem is there are also those people who, because they, are, they have reacted to the uh, strictness of the previous generation, now they are too permissive. They don't want to mention any fault of their children. They just let them be. I tell you, that is very scary. This is what will happen. There was this guy uh, many years ago who wrote uh, some tips or suggestions on how to train your child to be a delinquent. Do you want your child to be a delinquent? He says, I have here 11 suggestions for you if you want to, your child to be a delinquent or a lawbreaker. Number one, if you want your child or you want to train your child to be a delinquent, do this when your kid is still an infant. Give him everything he wants. This way, he will think the world owes him a living when he grows up. Number two, when he picks up swearing and off-color jokes, laugh at him and encourage him. As he grows up, he will pick up cuter phrases that will floor you. Number three, if you want to train your child to be delinquent, do this. Never give him any spiritual training. Wait until he is 21 and let him decide for himself. Four. Avoid using the word wrong. It will give your child a guilt complex. You can condition him to believe later when he is arrested for stealing a car that society is against him and he is being persecuted. Five, if you want to train him to be a delinquent, do this, pick up after him. His books, shoes, and clothes. Do everything for him so he will be experienced in throwing all responsibility unto others. Six, let him read all printed matter he can get his hands on. Never think of uh, monitoring his TV programs. Sterilize the silverware, but let him feast his mind on garbage. Number seven, quarrel frequently in his presence. Then he won't be too surprised when his home is broken up later. Number eight, satisfy his every craving for food. Drink in comfort. Every sensual desire must be gratified. Denial may lead to harmful frustrations. Number nine, if you want to train your child to be a delinquent, do this. Give your child all the spending money he wants. Don't make him earn his own. Why should he have things as tough as you did? Ten, take his side against neighbors, teachers, and policemen. They're all against him. Number 11, and the last, if you want to train your child to be delinquent, do this. When he gets into real trouble, make up excuses for yourself by saying, I never could do anything with him. It's just a bad seed. Want to have a child like that? Withhold discipline. But I tell you, it will destroy your child for life. That's why it's very important to discipline our children. I understand it is no longer popular nowadays. But here in our church, we provide ways. We give suggestions, teachings, principles on how to do this in a way that will uh, not be considered as abusive. We have to discipline our children. Look at Proverbs 22, verse 15. It says here, Folly or foolishness is bound up in the heart of a child, but the rod of discipline drives it far from him. Proverbs 23, 13 and 14. Do not withhold discipline from a child. If you strike him with a rod, he will not die. 
If you strike him with a rod, you will save his soul from Sheol or the grave. Of course, there's a right way of doing it. We do not believe in severe discipline or striking our children in just about anywhere, right? The point is we have to discipline our children according to the Word of God. Now, bringing up our children in the ways of the Lord is our responsibility as parents, not someone else's. Of course, the relatives who are living at home, the grandparents, the uncles, the aunties who are living with you could help. The Christian school could help raise your children in the ways of God. The church, the pastors, the youth leaders, the Sunday school teachers, all could help. Even the nannies could help you rear up your children in the ways of God. But in the end, this responsibility lies squarely on the shoulder of parents. These are your parents, other children' parents. These are your stewardship from the Lord. It is our responsibility to bring them up in the ways of God. Now, some parents think that their responsibility towards their children is only to provide for their material needs. So they think they just work hard, find ways to earn uh, more so that they will have uh, uh, more to give to their children. No wonder their children end up having, you know, everything. They end up having children who are well provided for but are delinquent. Providing for their material needs is just one of the responsibilities. The other one is to bring up our children in the ways of the Lord. Now, here's a sad confession of a father. Let me read to you his very own words. He said, I took my children to school, but not to church. He said this when his children were already grown up, and he no longer had any influence on them or control over them. He said, I took my children to school, but not to church. I taught them to drink, but not of the living water. I enrolled them in little league, but not Sunday school. I showed them how to fish, but not to be fisher of men. I made the Lord's Day a holiday rather than a holy day. I taught them the church was full of hypocrites and made the greater hypocrite of them and me. I gave them a color TV, but provided no Bible. I handed them the keys to the car, but did not give to them the keys of the kingdom of God. I taught them how to make a living, but failed to bring them to Christ, who alone can make a life. That's very sad. Parents, we have a limited time to influence our children for the Lord. Let's do it. Let's diligently teach our children. Let us faithfully discipline them so that they will grow truly knowing God, loving God, serving God all the days of their lives. Now, take note that this is primarily the responsibility of fathers. Do you realize that? Many times at home, it's the mothers who are disciplining the children. It's the mothers who are uh, teaching their, their, their children the ways of God, not the fathers. But interestingly, in the Bible, it says that this responsibility is primarily on the shoulders of the fathers. Look at Ephesians 6, 4 again. The Apostle Paul says, Fathers, do not provoke your children to anger but bring them up in the discipline and the instruction of the Lord. Mother's role is that of support. Mothers are there to support the fathers, do their job. You see, fathers are the head of the family, especially in spiritual matters, whether for good or for bad. Do you realize, fathers, that you influence your children in matters of spirituality, whether for good or for bad? Really? According to one's research, 
children take their spiritual lead from their father, whether they like it or not, or whether they are aware of it or not. According to this study, if only the mother goes to church, only 15% of her children will go to church when they are grown. Again, according to this survey or study, if only the mother goes to church, only 15% of her children will go to church when they are grown. However, if the father goes to church, even without the mother, just the father, if the father goes to church, the percentage goes up to 55%. Of course, if both the father and mother go to church, more children or 72% will also go to church when they grow up. What do we see here? Children take their lead from their fathers, whether for good or for bad. So fathers, don't forget this. This responsibility primarily lies upon your shoulder. It's not easy, right? But if we really want to do it, we can do it. Let's stop uh, making the excuse that we're so busy with work. Who is not busy with work anyway, right? Mothers are also busy at work, right? Wives. We live in a time when women are career women. <laughs> Not only the fathers are doing the job, everybody does work outside, including the mothers. But, but why can the mothers, even if they're already so tired outside, when, why can they still teach their children, rear up their children when they get home? It's a mother, ma matter of priorities. If you believe that this is your role, your responsibility before God, you will do anything. To fulfill that responsibility. Parents, especially fathers, do not exasperate your children or do not provoke them to anger. And instead, the Lord says, bring them up in the training and the instruction of the Lord. This is not easy, but the Lord is with us. We can turn to Him. We can ask for more patience toward our children. We can ask for more wisdom so that we can guide our children so that they will grow up knowing God, serving God, loving Him all the days of their lives. Let's pray. Father in heaven, thank you so much for your word that reminds us, that teaches us how to nurture our children in your ways. Thank you also, Lord, for the Holy Spirit who is in us, who empowers us, to fulfill our very difficult responsibility. I pray, Lord God, for all parents in this room, encourage them, specifically those who are already at their wit's end. They don't know what to do with a certain child, perhaps a delinquent young person or teenager. Help them, Lord. Empower them. Encourage them. Bring others, other believers to come alongside with them so that they will be able to fulfill their parental responsibilities toward their children. We pray, Lord God, that you will enable us to be effective parents to our children so that someday when we stand before you, we'll be able to offer to you our children as people who have grown to know you, love you, serve you all the days of their lives. All by your grace, to the glory of your name. Thank you so much, Lord. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen and amen.